Okay, so as you know, I am participating in Trans Girl April. I'm reading a book by trans and non-binary uh, authors this month, and I completed three of those books uh, last week, and I wanted to talk to you about them uh, today. The first book I want to talk to you about is Trans Like Me by C.N. Lester. So this is essentially a book of 15 essays that I think were written specifically for the book by C.N. Lester, who is uh, genderqueer um, and, you know, who kind of is most comfortable in that space between what we think about as the traditional genders. That appears to be the case from, from having read the book. And as someone who is not uh, genderqueer or trans or non-binary uh, or those things, as a cisgendered man, uh, I have so many questions that I want to ask members of the trans community, uh, that I want to ask members of the non-binary community, that things I want to know, things that I want to understand. Uh, and one of the things that uh, has uh, occurred to me, one of the things that I've learned, one of the things that I've, I think, where areas where I've grown is to realize that it's not the responsibility of trans people to explain their experience to me, of non-binary people to explain their experience to me, or, you know, even in a broader sense, of people of different races uh, or genders to explain the experience to me. That, in a sense, I have a responsibility to go out and learn that for myself. And for me, C.N. Lester's book, Trans Like Me, was a really good starting point. Now, it's possible that a trans person or non-binary person uh, might read C.N. Lester's book and feel like it misrepresents the experience that's not a good starting point. I, I don't know that, and I can only start from the position I start in. So I wanted to preface everything I have to say about Lester's book with that, that I am coming at this book as someone who wants to understand and seeing this book as uh, a beginning point for understanding. Now, before I move on, let me just say that I don't have to understand what it's like to be a trans person or a non-binary person uh, fully, I don't have to understand that to support the fact that trans people and non-binary people and everybody has rights. They have rights to live their lives the way that makes them feel fulfilled. That it's not my responsibility, whether I understand or not, uh, to uh, uh, believe and support the idea that they have rights. They don't need my acceptance. They need the rights of everyone else. But to talk about Cian Lester's book, I felt that the book was a really good introduction to uh, the experience of being trans, being non-binary. You know, Lester kind of takes us through uh, their own uh, voyage, I guess, or that's a bad word, their own experiences and their own journey to kind of come to a place of comfort with themselves uh, and who they were and a place where they could live their life fulfilled. And these essays cover so many topics like you know, issues related to sex, issues related to trans community and feminism, uh, issues related to, you know, the biology of sex and gender. Uh, and it explains these things in such an incredibly, I think, powerful and an informed way, and also in a personal way. You know, Lester doesn't pretend that they speak for everyone uh, in the trans or non binary community, but they share their experiences, good and bad, uh, horrific and, you know, uplifting, um, and at the same time include, you know, history of the trans and non-binary community, uh, history of effort to, uh, to develop gender-affirming care, uh, sometimes nightmarish, sometimes uh, positively, um, and they, they kind of look at all these issues. Oh, science and biology is involved here, and they kind of look at all these issues in a way which I think was really um, understandable and effective, and I felt like it gave me uh, a good grounding in, uh, you know, kind of a place to go on and think more and to study more and to learn more about the experience of being trans and non-binary. So I thought the book was really good. Uh, I don't believe that, you know, it's tempting, I think, and, and it's possible that uh, Lester maybe wrote this uh, book with the kind of non-trans, non-binary gaze in mind, maybe wrote for people like me, but I really think Lester's motivation in writing this was to share their own experiences, uh, to share their own research and their own knowledge 
with other people who uh, are like them, other non people who are questioning their gender identity, people who may be non-binary or trans, and kind of be the source of support. And the book is therefore kind of think takes on a sort a, a form of solidarity, uh, and you know a way of saying, look, this is really hard, and this is what happened to me. You know, this is kind of where I am, and maybe, you know, uh, you can find some solace in that, some comfort, some support in that. And I thought the book was really good uh, for all those reasons. Uh, the second book I read was uh, An Unkindness of Ghosts by River Solomon. Uh, River Solomon is a non-binary uh, author, and this book is a work of, you know, speculative science fiction, speculative literary fiction. Uh, it takes place on a what has to be a really huge spaceship, uh, you know, traveling through outer space, it is more or less like um, uh, an arc uh, where humanity has escaped what I'm going to assume is supposed to be a representation of Earth, uh, which for whatever reason was dying and no longer capable of supporting life. They are out in space. The ship is powered by its own kind of sun, which is powered through a nuclear reactor. Uh, and on this ship, we see a representation of society. It is an extremely caste-oriented society with the upper classes, the rich, the powerful, the influential uh, living at the top and sucking up most of the resources and the lower classes literally living on uh, the lower levels uh, of the ship, doing most of the work, uh, living lives, you know, uh, that are used up quickly, that are short, they're short on resources, food, heat, clothing, they're subject to arbitrary rules. And the women, uh, or the, the female people living on these levels, are subject to sexual violence on a regular basis from white guards uh, and male guards who are there to enforce the rule that comes down uh, from on high. It is, a, it is a dictatorial society, an authoritarian society, uh, a very class-based society, a very race-based society, a very gender uh, based society. And as such, uh, it is, I think, clearly intended to be somewhat of an analog for the way in which uh, Western society uh, is organized. But, you know, since it is a work of speculative fiction, kind of taken to an extreme. Uh, main character is named Aster, uh, and Aster, I think, is a non-binary character um, uh, who lives uh, with a group of young women, um, some of whom she's friends with, some of whom she has, uh, you know, uh, tense relationships with, and she is you know, almost a born rebel. There are several reasons for this. Part of it had to do with her non-binary status. Part of it has to do with one of her, her really great friends who is clearly a rebel. Part of it has to do with maybe a legacy from her mother who, uh, who we learn uh, essentially we're told was a suicide. Part of it may have to do with the teachings of uh, her uh, aunt, her grandmother, and people like that, but she is a rebel, and she is really good at um, healing. She is uh, kind of like on the lower levels where she lives. She's used to do healing and medical procedures, and we find out that she has a relationship, not a sexual relationship, with someone who's just referred to as the surgeon, who is an upper level uh, resident. In fact, he is a relative of the dictator who runs the place. Uh, and this relationship has afforded her with opportunities and access and benefits and to a certain extent privileges that other people don't have, but it also puts her in constant danger. Um, and what we learn then as the, as the story goes on, what we learn what the real issue with this ship is and what is causing uh, tension in society. And that, that is essentially that there are power outages and uh, when there are power outages, Resources are sucked away from the people on the bottom and given to the people on top, and that's leading to social unrest. And so that's kind of the backdrop. But I think more importantly, one of the things I think is most beautiful about the book and most effective about the book are the relationships that Aster has. Aster and her friend, possibly one of her uh, female love interests who lives with her, who uh, they have a very tense relationship, but Maybe a very volatile relationship would be a better way to say it. I wish I could remember the character's name, but I'm really bad at characters' names. Her relationship uh, with her mother, who's dead, and that relationship is built through her mother's writings, which Aster uh, has and uh, reads and tries to understand. Her relationship with the surgeon, who is a... Um, 
and then her relationship with her aunt or her grandmother, I can't remember which, and how all these relationships between Aster and these women and these people in our community who are the outsiders, who are the people who are in the most danger, how that kind of uh, leads to a determination on her part to bring about change. And I won't go into too many, uh, any, any, into any more depth here because there's spoil that would be spoilers, but I thought the book was really good. I will say, uh, that one of my problems with science fiction in general is that oftentimes the world building isn't perfect. It bothers me because there are, you know, obviously then things that that I don't understand that in, you know, you know pro prohibit me from understanding what the book is about fully. And I think that that's true here. You know, I have a pretty good understanding of how society works at different levels of ships, but it's not perfect. Now, in part, that's because. Solomon doesn't spend any time, world, doesn't spend a lot of time world building, and I like that, uh, much like uh, M.K. Jemison did in uh, the Broken Earth trilogy. We're just thrown into the story, and we pick up on things as we go along. I just don't think Solomon pulled it off quite as well as Jemison did, and that's a really high standard. Uh, so, you know, there, there's that aspect of it. I will also say that, you know, this book would come with trigger warnings uh, for rape, for violence, uh, for surgical violence. Um, that all those kinds of things are, are part of this book as well. Uh, those things didn't prevent me from enjoying it, but I know because I've heard from people that some people found those things to be uh, too sad, too triggering, triggering is the wrong word, too upsetting uh, to, to really enjoy the book. So, you know, take that as a warning. The third book I read is Don't Call Us Dead, a book of poetry by Denez Smith. Denez Smith is also uh, uh, non-binary. I'll be honest with you, these poems are, these poems reminded me of the raw emotion of uh, Langston Hughes and his later serious poems uh, about race and racism in the United States. Uh, you know, one of my favorite poets is uh, Nikki Giovanni, it reminded me of Nikki Giovanni and kind of the wry, um, practical acceptance of, not acceptance, but right practical depiction of injustice uh, and determination to move beyond that. Um, the poems cover subjects from having to do with violence against young black men in the United States of America, having to do with being HIV positive, having to do uh, with uh, being uh, non-binary, non uh, and engaging, uh, being attracted to primarily men, um, and they're very powerful poems. And I was tempted to read, you know, long sections of them, but I just thought I would read uh, a short section from one poem called "Crown," and this is from later uh, in the uh, collection. And as you go on in the collection, the the poems become much more about. Uh, about Smith's reality as an HIV positive, uh, non-binary black man in the United States, um, and I think the poems throughout are are really powerful. Before I read this, let me go on and point out that Smith incorporates history of Black America, the United States, injustice, racist violence, racist violence. Um, you know, images here in the United States. You'll find you know references to all those things. Uh, in the poems, and I, I think it's done really well. Now, the same is is true with all, for me, with all books of short stories or all book, all poetry books. There's some that work better for me than others, and I think that is not a weakness of the form. I think that is a reflection of the author's ability to appeal to lots of different readers in lots of different ways. But I just wanted to read you this short passage uh, from uh, the poem Crown. Into the vial, all the children I'll never have. Dead in me, widow father, sack fat with mourning, dusk is the color of my blood, blood and milk colored, chalk virus, the boy writes on me and erases, the boy clasps me between his hands and I break apart like glitter. I just think, I just wanted to read that to give you some idea of the beautiful uh, language and images, the rawness, the, the kind of harshness of that reality that um, 
I think, Smith introducing these poems, and I really like them. Anyway, there you go. There's my wrap-up of uh, the three books that I read last week uh, for Trans Girl April. I look forward to your comments. If you've read these books, please leave me a comment in, in the comment section down below what you thought. I look forward to those comments, and as always, thank you for watching.